Motion number three on exiting the European Union, civil aviation. I call the Minister to move the motion. Rachel McLean. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is a great pleasure to debate this SI, my first on the floor, and I only ever had my first SI debate yesterday. And I therefore beg to move that this draft instrument will be made under the powers conferred by the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 and will be needed at the end of the transition period. As honourable members are aware, the Government is committed to ensuring that the UK has a functioning statute book at the end of the transition period, while we continue to work to achieve a positive future relationship with the EU. Although the Government will seek to reach the best outcome for the UK and the EU, it is our duty to make reasonable preparations for all scenarios, including by ensuring that there is a functioning statute book, irrespective of the outcome of the negotiations. To that extent, we have conducted intensive work to ensure that there continues to be a well-functioning legislative and regulatory regime for aviation, including for insurance. This instrument is made under Section 8 of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. It is subject to the affirmative procedure because it transfers an EU legislative function to a public authority in the UK. This procedure also enables the right level of parliamentary scrutiny for the proposed changes. EU Regulation 785-2004 on insurance requirements for air carriers and aircraft operators requires air carriers and aircraft operators to be insured in respect of passengers, baggage, cargo and third parties, and against other risks such as acts of war, terrorism, hijacking, acts of sabotage, unlawful seizure of aircraft and civil commotion. The amounts for which carriers and operators are required to be insured are measured in special drawing rights, an international reserve asset created by the International Monetary Fund. The EU regulation also requires air carriers and aircraft operators to demonstrate their compliance with the minimum insurance requirements set out in the regulation. Elements of the regulation were also developed in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks in the US. They make provision for exceptional situations where a failure of the insurance market means that carriers are not able to demonstrate that they are adequately insured in respect of all the risks specified in the regulation. The Withdrawal Act will retain Regulation 785-2004 in UK law in its entirety at the end of the transition period. The draft regulations we are considering make further changes necessary so that the EU regulation continues to function correctly after the end of the transition period. The Withdrawal Act will ensure that the same minimum insurance requirements for air carriers and aircraft operators that apply today continue to apply after the transition period. The earlier Civil Aviation Insurance Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018, which was debated in committee in October 2018, makes changes to the retained regulation so that it continues to function correctly after EU exit. The need for the additional SI we are debating today has arisen due to the EU adopting Regulation 2019-1243, which amended Regulation 785-2004 after the 2018 regulations were made. The purpose of this SI is to fix further deficiencies introduced by those amendments. The amendments made by this SI are technical in nature. Regulation 785-2004 includes powers for the Commission to adjust minimum required levels of insurance where international treaties make this necessary. The 2018 regulations converted these into powers for the Secretary of State to do the same by regulations. However, since the 2018 regulations were made, the EU's amendments to Regulation 785-2004 have replaced the Commission powers with new versions more closely aligned to the legal framework established by the Treaty of Lisbon. To ensure that UK legislation continues to function correctly after the end of the transition period, these regulations take the same approach used in the 2018 regulations for the previous versions of the Commission powers. They replace them with powers for the Secretary of State to amend the minimum insurance requirements by regulations. That is what the SI is for. In summary, no change in policies made by these regulations. They only make minor technical and consequential changes to ensure that UK legislation on aviation insurance continues to function effectively after the end of the transition period. As I said in my opening words, we are continuing to work to achieve a positive future relationship with the EU. 
However, this instrument is an essential element for ensuring we have a functioning statute book at the end of the transition period. The changes that this SI make are technical and are made to ensure that UK legislation on aviation insurance continues to function. And I hope colleagues will join me in supporting these regulations. I commend these regulations to the House. Thank you. The question is, as on the order paper, Kerry McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's um, been, I think, some four years since I stood at this dispatch box, so it's a, a pleasure to be back here. I did take part in transport orals a few weeks ago, but that was um, on one of those screens. Um, so uh, uh, I'm very uh, pleased to be here shadowing the Minister today. Um, I think we've already established a constructive relationship. We did our first SI together yesterday in committee and um, as I said to her, I will be writing to her and um, scrutinising what she does but in a spirit of very um, constructive uh, work in. I think particularly uh, we have the decarbonisation of transport brief, we have the um, EU transition brief and um, both of those are incredibly important um, in, in current circumstances. The um, statutory instrument that we're talking about today is uncontroversial in that we accept that now that Britain has left the European Union and the end of the transition period is in sight, we do need to transfer relevant powers away from the European Commission and to the Secretary of State for transport as smoothly as possible. Which is not to say that, as more I understand, there is a number of statutory instruments that will be coming forth from the Honourable Lady um, in coming months. And um, it's uh, you know, certainly uh, the fact that this could be seen purely as a mechanistic approach to, you know, to ensure continuity doesn't mean to say that we won't scrutinise and challenge if we do have concerns about the way the government is doing things. And as the um, Minister has said, this measure is there to ensure that there are minimum insurance requirements for air carriers and aircraft operators in respect to passengers, baggage, cargo and third parties. And my understanding is that this, was, um, this stems from the 1999 Montreal Convention, whereby airlines are responsible for compensation um, in the case of death and injury to passengers and are required to be adequately insured to cover any liabilities. The EU Civil Aviation Insurance Regulation sets out the minimum level required. And that is one, my one question. I think the Minister answered it in um, her opening remarks. But um, given that this does transfer power from the European Commission to the Minister to set those minimum requirements and that he or she in future can do so by um, regulation. Does that mean that there is potentially a risk that the minimum insurance levels will not be at the same level as they would be if we were still part of the um, EU scheme? I think that's, that's quite an important um, uh, point to, to note. Um, as I've mentioned, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is one of many statutory instruments that this government is having to rush through Parliament due to what I would say is an unnecessary focus on an arbitrary date in our exit from the transition period. I am quite concerned, given the limitations on parliamentary scrutiny at the moment because of the, um, the, you know, the need for social distancing, the fact that not as many people can take part in proceedings and the delay that we've had over the past few months, that um, there is a danger that we could be rushing delegated legislation rather than giving it the uh, proper attention that it deserves. And I also think in terms of certainty for the people that would be affected by such legislation, we don't want a logjam towards the, the end of this year when nobody's quite sure whether arrangements will be put in, in place or not. So at least the, the fact that we've now got started and we've, we've done two of these SIs this week is a good start. I, I don't, however, think that setting this end date for the transition period in law has been beneficial to the legislative process, and I am concerned about the apparent lack of progress in ongoing negotiations with the European Union. Um, uh, the concerns about a damaging exit at the end of the year are, are very real. And this is particularly important for the aviation industry, given that we are in a time of unprecedented economic upheaval for the sector. The... Um, need for certainty for aviation has never been more important at the moment and we know that that brexit was inevitably going to have an impact on a business that is you know by its very nature uh, uh 
about crossing borders and uh, relationships with other countries. But the global pandemic has hit aviation especially hard too. There's been a devastating collapse in air traffic of approximately 90%, which is putting at risk a vital economic industry that supports 230,000 jobs. And clearly, we now need clarity from the government on three major policy areas. The first is what we're discussing here today, the legislation related to European Union and the transition period. We also need clarity on the financial support for the industry, and we also need clarity on the nature of the measures the industry must implement to avoid further spread of COVID-19. And I'm pleased that today we are establishing a degree of clarity in one aspect as it relates to the um, EU transition period, but confusion still reigns over the government's quarantine for new arrivals, and we continue to wait for a specific conditional support package for the aviation industry. I'm very happy to, and my colleagues in the Shadow Transport team are very happy to work with the front bench to try to ensure that the aviation industry is given the certainty, the clarity of direction and the support that it needs. Yeah. Andrew Griffith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is my first chance to welcome the Minister as well as the Honourable Member for Bristol East to their places. And may I congratulate them both on having secured such an important brief at such a critical time. I am pleased to support the Government today on this Bill. As we leave the European Union and become a sovereign state once again, we should feel capable to regulate our own affairs and to set our own level of insurance requirements in aviation. Just as it makes sense to control our own fisheries and protect our own marine environment, so it makes sense to do so for the sky above our heads. But the acid test of a regulatory structure must be to support the aviation and aerospace sectors, and having taken back control, we must be generous and collaborative with our international partners. So I encourage the Minister to seek bilateral aviation safety agreements with both the US Federal Aviation Authority and the European ASA, and ensure that other than where there are opportunities to deregulate further than either, that we remain in alignment with both in respect of matters such as type certification, personnel licensing and training standards. Whilst on the subject of regulation, I should like to congratulate Sir Stephen Hillier on his appointment as the new chair of the Civil Aviation Authority. My constituency of Arundel and South Downs, as well as being one of the most beautiful from the ground, is even more spectacular from the air. It's home to the excellent South Down Gliding Club, formed in 1930 and one of the oldest in the United Kingdom. Sir Stephen has a distinguished aviation career, and I ask him to consider making as a priority in her term of office the protection of airspace for recreational general aviation, such as gliding, which is so critical in providing affordable access to the skies and thereby inspiring future generations. Madam Deputy Speaker, going into this pandemic, our aviation sector was world leading in terms of growth, jobs and competitiveness. But that is now at real risk. Aviation has taken the full force of the economic impact of the C-19 crisis, devastated by border closures and the drop in passenger demand. Many of my constituents in Arundel and South Downs work for British Airways, Virgin, TUI or other airlines, or for businesses which are part of the extended Gatwick supply chain. Constituents like Antonello and Graney Petteri, who have both served loyally British Airways for 24 years, their loyalty that is sadly not being reciprocated. I share their worry and frustration at how they are being treated and it's right that I raise it with the Minister here in Parliament today. Yet while other industries are beginning their recovery, the downturn for aviation has only been exacerbated by the imposition of blanket quarantine, which hangs the closed sign on Britain just as our competitors reopen for business. I believe my honourable friend, the member for Redditch, fully understands, having previously worked in the financial sector, that if planes full of passengers from Iceland whose last death from COVID was in April, or from COVID-free New Zealand, were landing in the UK this afternoon, it would actually lower our average infection rate. I'm reassured by the government's undertakings to implement air bridges as a matter of urgency, as well as to look again 
at testing on arrival, something I first raised in April. And perhaps the Minister would be so kind as to provide an update in her winding up. My final point on today's Bill relates to future opportunities. Together with quantum computing, artificial intelligence, fintech and the life sciences, aviation and aerospace is one of the key industrial sectors where UK businesses have a global competitive advantage in a growing and high-value industry. Gavin Newlands. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, and apologies for my late entrance. Uh, I was sauntering over unaware that the last SI would be moved formally, so um, the, the sauntering turned into a sprint once I saw the, the monitor. Um, so apologies. For the avoidance of doubt, um, in current circumstances, it is not necessary for everyone who is taking part in a debate to be here at the beginning, just in case the House happens to be full and we want to keep the numbers low. So, most unusually, the Honourable Gentleman has done absolutely nothing wrong. <laughs> I'll take that in the spirit which it's meant, Madam Deputy <laughs> Speaker. Um, but um, but on, on with the, the business at hand, the, the legislation of the SI before us um, comes at a very difficult time for the aviation sector, as has been uh, highlighted, uh, one which will undoubtedly see a, a significantly impacted and reduced sector by the time that these regulations come into force. And I should say at this point that notwithstanding the fact that Scotland uh, is being dragged out of the EU uh, and of the transition period very much against our collective will, and therefore this legislation is a matter of regret for us, it is not in our or anyone's interest to ensure that regulations ensuring established minimum insurance requirements for air carriers and aircraft operators in respect of passengers, baggage, cargo and third parties do not continue without interruption. That being said, perhaps in looking at the issue of insurance in aviation, we should be debating whether airlines have or can access appropriate business interruption insurance to cover situations like the one we face uh, right now. If they did, we may not be in a situation where so many of our constituents uh, waited inordinate lengths of time to secure a refund. Indeed, many are still fighting uh, to get one. Uh, that is why we in, on these benches have called on the government to implement a travel guarantee fund, which still may well be necessary. Uh, moreover, in my dealings with operators, uh, they say that the rights around cancellation refunds are essentially only one way. In other words, if the holiday provider cancels the holiday, be it due to travel advice or any other reason, the consumer is entitled to a full refund. If the passenger cancels the holiday due to travel advice, foreign uh, Commonwealth Office travel advice on the date of travel or the government's quarantine policy, only a portion of the refund, according to the terms and conditions of the booking, are payable. And I wonder if the, does the Minister think that is fair, although it strays outside the, the general scope of this, of this S SI. Of course, the, the sector may not be as scaled down as we fear if the, if the government were to show the same level of support for the, this strategic sector as many other governments around the world have, including Scotland. And I, I do not want to stray any further from the, the tight confines of this um, instrument, but need, needless to say, other issues, including um, the situation facing workers at Rolls Royce, British Airways, and right across the sector it may, may well be raised in, uh, in much detail in the adjournment debate which follows the uh, proceedings uh, shortly, which I shamelessly plug um, right now. Um, but back to the matter at hand, Madam Deputy Speaker, to conclude, uh, I reiterate that despite the fact that we do not accept the basis by which the UK Government gives effect to legislation that takes Scotland out, out of the EU, uh, nor the transfer of discretionary powers from the Commission uh, as an organisation accountable to the European Parliament and, and Member States to ministers as individuals. Uh, we recognise the need to ensure that, that um, EU regulations are maintained on exit day, regardless of the constitutional situation. This is in the interest of consumers, passengers and businesses, and as such we will not be voting against the motion today. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I first of all uh, uh, wish the uh, Minister, every success in her, in her new role, and we look forward to watching her progress. Also, the Shadow Minister, nice to, uh, to see uh, the Honourable Lady in her place as well, and, and I'm sure a long career beckons for both in different roles, perhaps, but uh, nonetheless, very important to see it. I thank Government and, and the Minister in particular for bringing forward these regulations to ensure that the removal of, of uh, what would be onerous Europe le European legislation is complete, whilst the very nature of aviation means that we are travelling large distances and into different countries and upholding their aviation rules. The fact is that we must be the ones who set our own standards, which are safe and appropriate, 
and which give the cover that is needed as the Minister has indicated. Regulation EC 75 2004 establishes minimum insurance requirements for the aircraft the air carriers and the aircraft operators in respect of passengers, baggage, cargo and third parties. It also requires that air carriers and aircraft operators should have insurance which covers specific risks, including all things that could possibly take place, acts of war, terrorism, hijacking, acts of sabotage, unlawful seizure of aviation uh, and also civil commotion. There are obviously protections that need to be in place, and yet the point of the matter is that if anything is to change in our aviation, it is imperative that whilst we will, will in all likelihood align with basic regulations, the decision lies where it should with ministers of this government, of our government. Our aviation sector is in unprecedented times, and this SI coming to this place today reminds the industry uh, that we have a role to play in this industry going forward, as other honourable members have referred to. Whether well, that is support of the industry through production in the Bombardier uh, factory in Newton Arts in Michael City, similar to the one of the honourable gentlemen who spoke before, whether well, it is the support of our airports to enable them to keep connectivity across the whole of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and globally, whether it is the support of airline staff and uh, uh, baggage handlers, for instance British Airways, as the honourable gentleman referred to, where a number of my constituents are very concerned about their future, some of them with 30 plus years of uh, commitment, loyal commitment to British Airways, um, are in support of individual airlines. The pandemic will mean change for our aviation sector. Hard times are ahead, uh, but tomorrow can be a better day uh, as, as if we have the commitment that the Minister and our Government are, are showing uh, for our aviation sector. We have a role to play. And this SI coming at this time clearly shows that not only are we determined uh, uh, to leave Europe and stand alone at the date, regardless of coronavirus, a European determination to exploit what has been an awful time, not simply for the global economy, but importantly for all the families involved directly with the aviation sector in the UK. This small wording and legislation change shows that not only are we prepared to leave at the date, we are also mindful of the needs of the industry and equipped to do and to deal with that. Such a small change that for some may seem meaningless, and yet the message is clear. The aviation industry is a priority for members of this House, uh, and, and I for one will look at and sow into anything that affects the industry to strengthen or weaken. With that in mind, I support the SI bringing power back to this House. Rachel McLean. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's a great opportunity for members across the House to express their support for the aviation industry, both in their own constituencies and in the country as a whole, and we as a government share that support. The Honourable Lady from Bristol East has uh, given a very clear commitment and a very welcome commitment that she will be supporting this particular SI today, although I absolutely understand that she may wish to reserve the right to oppose and debate in the future, as is absolutely right. She asks about the uh, transfer of powers from the European Commission to the Secretary of State, and I can reassure her that as part of preparations for leaving the Euro European Union, we as a responsible government are preparing for all scenarios, and we absolutely expect that the minimum insurance levels will apply for aviation in any scenario. She refers to the amount of SIs that we have to get through, and we are in the department are working very closely with officials to make sure that we can reach those commitments, and we are confident we expect to be able to do that. We absolutely expect to stick to our commitments that we've given, uh, especially around aviation. So she refers also to the financial support that we are discussing and looking at providing to the aviation industry. And the aviation minister, my colleague, has been to this dispatch box and discussed those points, and I will certainly take that back to her. But I would like, just like to reference there's a vast range of support that's been given to businesses across the country, um, including many of the airlines that, that we all use. And we expect that to continue, and we will keep all these measures under review. She finally asked me a little bit about the government's uh, position on social distancing and on quarantine, and she will know that all these measures are kept under review, and our priority is to keep people safe and be guided by the science. And we will continue that dialogue because we understand the pressures on the aviation sector. 
It is a great pleasure to also have my hon. Friend from Arundel and the South Downs in the constituency, and he highlights the importance of aviation in his own constituency. I understand he has a, a gliding club. I am not sure whether he is a keen glider himself, but I, I wish them well. I can reassure him that we have already agreed a bilateral aviation safety agreement. We already have that in place with the US. Uh, in, in, to the matter of air bridges, which he touched on, again, th- this is a policy of the government that has been introduced because we, we expect we need to keep people safe. That is our priority. But these are matters that, again, we are looking into closely and we are keeping all of those under review as the position of the coronavirus pandemic progresses in the country. Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you to the Minister for giving way. On the issue of air bridges, can I ask, um, in looking at this issue um, and looking at the, the dates of potentially bringing any, any air bridges in, um, are they looking at the different holiday seasons around the UK? Because it, obviously England and Wales have a significantly later holiday season than that of Scotland and Northern Ireland, so therefore Scottish and Northern Irish airports will be adversely impacted if air bridges are brought in at the end or after the, the Scottish and Northern Ireland holiday seasons. Good point. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his point. This, these matters are outside the scope of this particular SI, but I can assure the Honourable Gentleman that I, in my role as a Transport Minister, actually speak to the devolved administrators on a regular basis. So all these concerns are being discussed and looked at in the Department, and I will certainly take that, that back. The Honourable Member for Strangford again expressed his support for aviation security. He mentions the Bombardier plant in his constituency, and we are aware of all those concerns, and we are very keen to work closely with him. And again, the issue of connectivity is something that I discuss with colleagues from Northern Ireland on my regular meetings with them. So the Government recognises the importance of preparing throughout the year to ensure that we bring forward the required legislation for all possible scenarios at the end of the transition period and for Parliament to have the opportunity to scrutinise it in the normal way. This instrument, as we have seen, is essential to ensure that the legislation on aviation, which are an important part of the regulatory framework for civil aviation, continues to work effectively at the end of the transition period. So I hope that the House has found this informative and that it will join me in supporting these regulations. Thank you. The question is the motion on exiting the European Union civil aviation as on the order paper. As many as that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you.